Welcome to Time of the Signs, a weekly teaching of eschatology, the study of the last days, featuring Bible teachers from the past and present who will equip you to recognize the sign of the times happening all around us today. Open your Bible and follow along so you can increase your knowledge of Bible prophecy and understand how to share our blessed hope with others. Today's feature is a 1986 interview with Dave Hunt on Hal Lindsey's radio program. Dave, welcome to our program. Very good for you to share some of the responses you've had, some of the responses in letters, and uh, just to kind of let people know the interest that has been stirred here. Uh, Hal, thank you very much for <clears throat> having me. Uh, some of the letters that are not directed to me um, if I can find one here, for example, here's one on the letterhead of the International Convention of Faith Churches and Ministers, Inc., which was actually found on a playground, believe it or not, in a, a school, a high school in Florida, where I happen to know the, the uh, principal, and uh, it was turned into him, and otherwise I wouldn't have gotten it. It just went out to the ministers. This is the, the Positive Confession uh, group of, of mm -hmm. churches, and he says, I'm writing in regard to a new book recently published by a relatively unknown author, David Hunt. This book, Seduction of Christianity, devotes some of his content to destroying Bible faith, slandering faith ministries. You know, I'm not slandering anybody. Yeah. I wrote back to him, slandering is lying about someone. Right. If you can show me anywhere in the book that we've lied about anyone or misquoted anyone, we'll change it. Right. Uh, anyway, he tells the ministers out there, don't talk about this book. <laughs> don't let anybody read it. Uh, we get letters from people in these churches where the pastor has said, don't read this book and they went out and read it and because they read it um, the Lord really set them free a lot of people are being well, set free. Well, Dave you need to really thank these ministers who are banning your book I found uh, for instance in Israel when the late great planet earth was translated into Hebrew uh, it was banned by a number of the rabbis in Israel and that was the greatest favor uh -huh. they could have done me because sure. then everyone was carrying it around in a brown paper bag <laughs> Wanting to find out. Here's just, just let me read a couple of them here. This person says, I just got a copy of the Seduction of Christianity. Praise the Lord. Every pastor, believer, and especially new Christian should read it. I suffered. Now, these are the things you don't hear, Hal. And, and we're not attacking these people, but I think there ought to at least be a recognition that um, what is being taught mainly on television is believed only by a small fraction of the church. Right. Uh, the positive confession movement, for example, is considered heresy by the Assemblies of God, which is the largest Pentecostal church. But this is not uh, recognized. Mm -hmm. This person says, I suffered in the positive confession and healing movement for five years. I had a health problem that was hard to find the cause of and the people in this faith teaching made you feel like something was wrong because you couldn't get well the Lord finally led me out of it by a tape by Mr. Martin talking about Walter Martin Walter Martin yeah. uh, on the errors of positive confession and into a church that really uh, does teach the Bible and not just what Hagen and Copeland and certain other leaders say about it and then goes on and says how the, the book has has helped them. This person says, as a former adherent to the Word of Faith teaching, my life was hell on earth for three years. This was complicated by the fact that I was in a sort of mystical fog during that time, totally out of touch with reality. And then they go on and say how reading uh, the seduction of Christianity really set them free. They're back in the Word of God. They're praising the Lord. Um, this was from... That was from Lake, Lake Isabella. California. The other one was from... Um, Somewhere in Idaho, I can't read it. Yeah. Wow, I can't read that writing either, but it's in Idaho. Listen, for the sake of our listeners, some might not understand the word of faith or the positive confession type of teaching. Could you give us a brief explanation? Of it? Yes, in my opinion, Hal, it's a, uh, a, a twisting of scriptures. For mm -hmm. example, they will take Hebrews 11.3 where it says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of god mm -hmm. and they will turn this around mm -hmm. to say we understand that it was by faith that god framed the world mm -hmm. now i mean you're a greek uh, mm -hmm. uh, exegete <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, it just i don't know where you would find anybody who would even say that yeah. well this is incredible <laughs> you know i 
I have, by the way, you'll be the only one that's got a copy of my manuscript of my new book other than the publisher, but I brought a copy of it for you this morning because I sincerely want your opinion. Mm -hmm. But in my new book coming out soon, The Combat Faith for the Last Days, I go into the fact that faith, by the very definition of the root meaning of the word, mm -hmm. means a cessation of your own efforts and work in order to lean upon and depend upon the, the strength of another. Right. Now, what they're saying is God had to depend upon someone else right. to create the world. Right. I mean, this is a contradiction of the meaning of faith. Right. Because there cannot be faith as long as you're still trying to do it. You, you have to cease your own efforts to do something in order to depend on someone greater. Right. Faith must have an object. Exactly. In God we trust. In whom does God trust? Right. So now what happens is faith becomes a power that God used to create the word, uh, world. This uh, power called faith is contained in words. Uh -huh. um, and God released his faith by speaking words. Mm -hmm. There is a power in words. So they talk about God said, <clears throat> God said, God said. Mm -hmm. Now this is an old occult idea as you know. Right. Uh, there are three techniques in the occult for mental alchemy. Mm -hmm. That is manipulating or creating reality with mm -hmm. your mind. One mm -hmm. of them is thinking. Mm -hmm. The power of positive thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, the more powerful is speaking confessing. Mm -hmm. It's where the mantra comes from. Mm -hmm. And then the third and most powerful is visualizing. You create a vision in your mind and then you give birth to this in reality. So now God spoke words because there's a power in words. We can speak words and it gets a little worse as you know how. At the heart of this is we are gods. Little gods under God. Are there some people actually teaching this? Oh definitely. You could get to, for example, the latest book by Charles Capps. It's called God's Image of You, a 1985 book. Mm -hmm. He seems to be responding to some of the things that I've been saying and exposing this. So he mm -hmm. says, uh, we're not teaching that you're God, spelled with a big G. Mm -hmm. We're teaching that you are a little God, and remember, you must spell it with a little G. Mm -hmm. uh, how that's incredible, because all gods other than the one true God are false gods, and every god spelled with a little G is under the judgment of God. Absolutely. We used to only hear things like that from the Mormons. Right. Ten years ago when you tried to tell, I tried to tell Christians that the Mormons believed they could become gods, they wouldn't believe it. They said, you must have misunderstood these fine people. Right. Now it's in the church of the evangelical church, the teaching that we are little gods. And because we're little gods, we can then speak this creative word mm -hmm. and call things that are not as though they are, just as God does, because we are in God's class, as these people say. Now this is, uh, I mean, the worst kind of heresy that, mm -hmm. that I could conceive of. It is. Now when you carry that to the its logical conclusion how and this of course touches on something that you've been dealing with for many years we ought to then confess healing and blessing and prosperity and redemption and in fact convert the whole world turn this world into a paradise mm -hmm. which means that there's no rapture the rapture is an escape theory mm. uh, we're going to turn this world into a paradise and set up the kingdom for, of, of God then Jesus will simply settle down on this earth and reign over the kingdom that we've established now of course if the real Jesus is going to catch us away mm -hmm. and we're going to meet him in the air and people are looking forward to meeting a Jesus who uh, when they meet him their feet are planted on planet earth and he simply has settled down to take over the kingdom they've established mm -hmm. they've been following the wrong Jesus and I'm very concerned about this well what is the name of this teaching I, we were talking about this on the phone this week uh, where many of our top Christian personalities today mm -hmm. are teaching that we should uh, we should reclaim the world that Satan took right and restore right. it right and have dominion over it and right. simply welcome Jesus back in other right. words that there would be no tribulation no antichrist right. no no rapture the second coming would simply be Christ coming back to take uh, take over a throne which we have won for him right well, it was called the Manifested Sons of God uh, teaching. Where did that come which, from? Well, that comes from uh, Romans 8, mm -hmm. uh, where it says the whole creation is groaning in travail, waiting mm -hmm. for the manifestation of the sons of God. So they would say, you see, we're not waiting for the rapture. We're mm -hmm. waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now, what they mean by that is that we are going to literally manifest immortality in these bodies on this earth without a resurrection mm -hmm. um, we are going to by claiming the promises and 
and speaking a positive confession. After all, no one should be sick. Uh, death should have no power over you. And if we really rise to the full stature of our godhood and recognize who we are, mm -hmm. then we can manifest immortality right here on this earth and transform this world mm -hmm. into a paradise. Mm -hmm. uh, now, these people are beginning to speak rather militantly also about those who oppose this teaching, mm -hmm. as though there is going to be a holy purging, uh, a holy war, in fact, and uh, uh, that those who oppose it are going to be either instantly removed by God to judgment or something is going to have to uh, be done uh, to them. But Charles Capps would teach, and the basic teaching is that because of this dominion that you mentioned, mm -hmm. Adam was created to be the God of this world. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that the title of Satan is the God of this world. Mm -hmm. And they will tell you that Satan literally stole that title from Adam. That Adam was the God of this world, and man is intended to be the God of this world. Satan stole the dominion. He got the title God of this world, and we have got to take the dominion back from Satan by the positive confession that we speak with the words of our mouths and become the gods of this world once again. Wow. You know, let's let's go to the scripture for a second and just dispel that sort of thing. First of all, the thing that comes to mind is Genesis 3. Why in the world would Eve have followed Satan's temptation when he said, you shall become as God or right. become God. like God, right. knowing good and evil? Why would she have responded to that if she was already God? Right. She wouldn't have. Another thing that comes to mind is that... Uh, the incident in Acts chapter 14 where Paul healed a man, Barnabas and Paul, mm -hmm. uh, in chapter 14, about verse right. 21, right. it says that they rushed out. They were going to declare them to be gods. They were going to do sacrifice mm -hmm. to them. And Paul said uh, he tore his clothes in, in, right. uh, in despair and said, don't, we're mere men mm -hmm. just as you are. Right. There uh, is some confusion, Hal, because in... Uh, John 10 34 Jesus did say is it not written in your law you are gods mm -hmm. now obviously he wasn't saying to them well we're all gods so it's nothing wrong with me calling myself the son of God because mm -hmm. we're all gods he was referring them to their own scriptures mm -hmm. he was referring them to uh, Psalm 82 verse 6 mm -hmm. and it's interesting their God says I have said you are gods now where did God say we are gods well you're gonna have to go all the way back mm -hmm. to Genesis 3 that you just turned to verse mm -hmm. 22 God says the man has become as one of us mm -hmm. to know good and evil whatever this godhood is that they're boasting of now man got it Mm -hmm. through believing the through lie, disobedience. Of, uh, through disobedience, God didn't want it. Mm -hmm. He got it in the garden mm -hmm. through disobedience. Because of that, he was cast out mm -hmm. because God would not perpetuate him in this fallen condition. And the judgment of God is upon all gods. Jeremiah 10, verse 11, the true God says, you say to the gods who have not created the heaven and the earth, they will perish from under this heaven and from this earth. That is all those who pretend to be gods. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, you said that there was something, uh, there were three tenets to this teaching. One was the word of faith, another was visualization, another was... Uh, think, uh, positive thinking. Positive thinking. Positive speaking, uh -huh. and then positive visualizing. Uh -huh. And uh, Norman Vincent Peale, for example, has a book called Positive Imaging, in which he tells you how he went out and got somebody to write out a check for $5,000, a contribution by uh, a friend of his was visualizing them doing it. I mean, it's not even ethical how mm -hmm. uh, now we can get people to write out checks for us by visualizing them. You're just going to have a bunch of Darth Vader's and Obi-Wan's out there zapping one another with mind power. Yeah. What we need to do is abdicate the throne of our lives and come back under a willing submission to the one true God and acknowledge our unworthiness and, and his greatness and come to him as repentant sinners. Mm -hmm. uh, not have I gotten, but what I received, grace has bestowed it since I have believed, boasting, excluded, pride I abase, I'm only a sinner saved by grace. Mm. That's our only plea. Amen. Well, where do you see this going, Dave? I mean, you've been out there talking to many, many people. Uh, What's happening as a result of your book? Well, you asked the me two, are really two, two questions now. Yeah. Um, there is a revolution going on that I never anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the book is selling extremely well. They're just having to go to the fifth printing, which would be 230,000 in six months, which, mm -hmm. as you know, is really astounding. Um, but 
I would say about 50 to 1, mm -hmm. the letters we receive are from people who are grateful, mm -hmm. who were in confusion, and, and they now understand what the problem was. Mm -hmm. But there's a really a counterattack mm -hmm. by those who feel that the Word of Faith ministry, the Positive Confession ministry, this whole Kingdom Dominion thing, is, is the rug is being pulled out from under it. Hi there, Al Sanders for 30 seconds enjoying being a name dropper, but with a good reason. Chuck Swindoll, Jack Hayford, Chuck Colson, Lloyd Ogilvie, Howie Hendricks, Karen Maines, John Stott, they, along with dozens of others, will be at COBE, the Congress on Biblical Exposition, March 3 to 6 at the Anaheim Convention Center in Marriott Hotel. And if you enjoy studying and teaching the scriptures, you should be there too. March 3 to 6, Anaheim for COBE. The Congress on Biblical Exposition. Well, Dave, as I understand it, there is one group of very influential teachers in our country, Christian teachers, who are saying that we're going to take dominion back from Satan, mm -hmm. that we're going to take back our godhood that Satan stole from us, mm -hmm. that through the positive confession, the word of the creative word of faith, right? We're going to bring and restore the dominion that Satan took back from man. Through this, we're going to bring about uh, a kingdom. And uh, once we establish God's kingdom on earth, then Christ is going to come back and and set on the throne of David over God's kingdom. You know. I have serious problems with this. This really right. hits on the area that I've concentrated right. on. First of all, it, uh, in order to believe that, you have to deny literally hundreds of prophecies. You yeah. have to say they just aren't real. They aren't literal. Right. They have to be allegory. Right. It denies the whole book of Revelation. It denies all that is said in all of that discourse in Matthew 24 and 25. Uh, it denies many of the teachings where Paul said in the last days perilous times will come the spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some will depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons mm -hmm. Jesus said in Luke 18 verse 8 when the Son of Man comes will he find faith on the earth right. etc I mean it talks about a time when uh, there would be great apostasy then the Antichrist would appear there would be an all-out apostasy and departure mm -hmm. from historic mm -hmm. truth. There'll be a terrible time of suffering, mm -hmm. that the earth will nearly be destroyed, that more than half the population of the earth will die, and then Christ will come back to put down all of man's uh, warring against each other and against God, and he will establish the kingdom. To stop destruction. In fact, right. Jesus says, except those days be short and no flesh would survive. Right. Now, if that's the result of having the church take dominion, oh, wow. <laughs> and Jesus has to intervene to stop the destruction, well, let's not have it happen. You know, what this is, is post-millennialism. It, it is. A form of. Right, right. Well, who is it that is, uh, who is it that's saying things like that? Well, I would say, Hal, that the um, major Christian television networks right. all are espousing this, some more openly than others. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, uh, Channel 40 recently here at TBN had Earl Polk. Now, I understand that Paul and Jan say they don't believe they don't agree with him they, but they, they don't but, they don't uh, right. agree with that teaching right. but they do uh, believe in the rapture mm -hmm. but nevertheless here was a man that they seem to be agreeing with who calls the rapture an escape theory mm -hmm. and who says and I'm quoting him verbatim just as dogs have puppies and cats have kittens so God has little gods mm -hmm. and until we realize that we're little gods you know and take over this world um, now that's verbatim that's verbatim right and it, what is this man's name Earl Polk. P-A-U-L-K. P-A-U-L-K. He has a large church, uh, Chapel Hill Harvester Church in Atlanta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, Hal, I That's mean, he's entitled, he's entitled his opinion, we're entitled to our yeah, opinion, absolutely. but I think there ought to be more of an open discussion of this yeah. on Christian media rather than just giving people one one side of it. Mm -hmm. um, now, Pat Robertson, and, and I think Pat Robertson is a man of God. Sure. I believe the Lord has powerfully used him. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Um, December 9th, 1984, speaking from 
Robert Tilton's Word of Faith World Outreach Center in Dallas, Texas. And by the way, Robert Tilton on pages 170 and 171 of his book, God's Laws of Success, says mm -hmm. that man was created to be the God of this world. Mm -hmm. That Satan stole the dominion, we've got to take this dominion back. You see, this is at the heart of the positive confession movement, which maybe we can trace later, comes from E.W. Kenyon. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, Kenneth Hagin has plagiarized the writings of E.W. Kenyon, who taught that we're gods and some other serious heresies mm -hmm. that Although Jesus said uh, it is finished from the cross, it wasn't really finished. He had to sink into hell as a sinful, helpless man to be tortured by Satan for three days and three nights. That's where our redemption comes from, mm -hmm. because he was tortured by Satan, and then he was born again and so forth. But uh, Pat Robertson, um, December uh, that, 9th... That is such... You know, I'm sitting here with my mouth open. That's such a heresy. It's that, incredible. I, this I is at the heart of the that. positive confession movement. Yeah. Right. Uh, this is believed by uh, Kenneth Copeland and Kenneth Hagen and so forth, and this is what they teach. Mm -hmm. December 9th, 84, from, on a satellite seminar series, Pat Robertson said, and I'm quoting him now off the tape, What's coming next? I want you to think of a world with a school system where humanism isn't taught anymore and people sincerely believe in the living God, a world in which there are no more abortions, juvenile delinquency is virtually unknown, the prisons are virtually empty, there's dignity because people love the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to imagine a society where the church members have taken dominion over the forces of the world, where Satan's power is bound by the people of God, there's no more disease, no more demon possession. People are living godly, moral lives, no drug addiction, pornographers have no access, the people of God inherit the earth, there's a spirit-filled president in the White House, and the men in the Senate and the House of Representatives are spirit-filled and worship Jesus, and the judges are the same. You say that's a description of the millennium when Jesus comes back, but these things can take place now in this time, and they're going to, because I'm persuaded we're standing on the brink of the greatest spiritual revival the world has ever known. Mm -hmm. So now, I mean, I would love to think of a world like yeah, that, sure. uh, but the Bible says, as you already quoted, happen. it's not going to happen. And you go to Zechariah chapter 12, where the armies of the world surround Jerusalem mm -hmm. and seek to destroy Israel. And Christ himself has to intervene. It hardly sounds mm -hmm. uh, like the, the church has taken over the world. Now, this is because Harold Bredesen in 1968 gave a prophecy, uttered a prophecy over Pat Robertson, mm -hmm. uh, in which God, supposedly speaking through Harold Bredesen, said, quote, I have called you to usher in the coming of my son, unquote. Now, Pat said that was in 1968. It was 15 years before we understood what that meant when the Lord gave us our television station in southern Lebanon. And you get the impression from listening to him that he's going to provide television coverage of the second coming of Jesus from his television station in southern Lebanon. Wow. Um, I, you know, whether Pat believes in the rapture or not, he's going to be raptured. You know, I believe yeah. he's a, a Christian just yes. as much as you and I are. Sure. But the, the old discussion, when you first came out with the late great planet Earth way back there, and I remember you standing in our living room, I don't know if you can remember, and holding up the mock cover yeah. of that book before it was published uh, right. to a gathering we had there. It's no longer pre, mid, or post-trib. But the question is becoming more and more rapture or no rapture. Mm -hmm. Now, the positive confession people are not the only ones. There are a number of streams out there. You've got people like the Sojourners. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got Jim Wallace, for example, the Sojourners, who when asked about Armageddon says, it's not biblical. There is no such thing as Armageddon. You've got the Reconstructionists, the Gary Norths and, and mm -hmm. people like this, Rush Doonies, who ridicule mm -hmm. the raptures and escape theory. We're going to take over the world for Jesus, they well, all say. Well, Dave, this is at the heart of the matter. One of the things, you know, I consider myself a charismatic, but one of the things I've always feared in the charismatic movement is a very, very faulty method of interpretation, uh -huh. which allows all kinds of subjective ideas to be imposed upon the text. And I think there, there are many charismatics who are real expositors, and they're the ones that are really taking issue with these things. Dave, for some time, in fact, for many years, I, I have uh, had problems with all oh, the book, The Power of Positive Thinking by Peel and uh, Possibility Thinking Concepts by mm -hmm. uh, our friend over in uh, Garden Grove. But as I look at this, this seems to take the take faith and make it something that has power in itself, something inside of us. And instead of, as the Bible presents, the power of faith is in the object, not in the faith itself. Right. And uh, 
I know that your book has made some very incisive comments about this, and uh, i just like to know what reaction have you got, gotten from some of the statements that you've made? Well, how I'm staggered by the reaction. Say we are not questioning that, that these people are Christians, that they're sincere, we're not judging their hearts, mm -hmm. but doctrine is an issue, and, and I know you stand firmly Absolutely. for this. Um, we can't be united on false doctrine. We must guard the purity of the, of the doctrine in the church, and the kind of reactions we get are ad hominem arguments, that is, personal attacks against me, my integrity, saying that I'm in it for money, uh, or whatever, but never dealing with the issues, never quoting. And uh, I was on a talk show like this in Seattle of, about a month ago, and I got rather a bit of a shock there, Hal, because in the middle of the show, the talk show host said, uh, Dave, have you heard what Robert Schuler is saying about you? And I said, no, I haven't. <laughs> and he said, well, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we'll play it. And uh, I have a transcript here. Uh, he was actually at a mall autographing book, his new book in Seattle, and uh, the radio station was making an interview. In the midst of the interview, they asked him, what do you think about the seduction of Christianity? It was like he became choked suddenly. And, mm -hmm. and this is verbatim what he said, I think it is demonic. I think it is satanic. I think it literally is that. I think it is a work of the devil. The Bible says the devil comes as an angel of light, and all I know is there are a lot of beautiful Bible-believing, evangelical, born-again Christians today who are running around with paranoia and suspicion because their minds have been poisoned by very irresponsible statements made in that book by an author who is a nobody, meaning he is totally uninformed, he has no credentials, the book doesn't say who he is, and Harvest House Publishing Company was interested in making money. They have only one purpose, and that's Bucks, and that includes Bob Hawkins, the owner of Harvest House. In a quote. Huh? In a quote. It's, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's slander. <clears throat> um, but uh, not dealing with the issues, but a personal attack on me. I was shocked that such a man who was always so positive could suddenly become so negative, you mm -hmm. know? Right. Uh, I wasn't sure that he really believed in, in Satan. But we need to deal with the issues. And <clears throat> uh, you were mentioning that faith becomes something that has a power in itself. And mm -hmm. on page 106 of, of, of the book, The Seduction of Christianity, we have a quote from The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale that I think you would find interesting. Mm -hmm. Quote, prayer power is a manifestation of energy. Just as there exist scientific techniques for the release of atomic energy, so are there scientific procedures for the release of spiritual energy through the mechanism of prayer. You see, this is religious science. It's Christian science. It's mind science. And all of these people say there are laws that work. Mm -hmm. And Paul Yonggi Cho, who, you know, he's the pastor of the largest church in the world, but that doesn't mean that he's 100% right on everything he says. Right. And in his book, The Fourth, Fourth Dimension, he tells you that he asked God, how is it that occultists can do miracles like Christians do miracles? Mm -hmm. He gives you the conversation he had with the Holy Spirit and, and he specified a particular occult group, Nichiren Shoshu, the Soka Gakkai. They chant, Nam Yoho Renga Kyo, Nam Yoho Renga Kyo, and they create reality. They're creating miracles. I mean, this is a positive confession. This is the power, the creative power of the spoken word. They believe in it. And he said God told him that they can do this because they are fourth dimension beings. God is a fourth dimension being. We're fourth dimension beings. In God's class, that goes for all human beings, whether you are a Christian or a non-Christian, an occultist or not. He commends the Soka Gakkai for what they have done in what he calls developing the laws of the fourth dimension. And he says Christians ought to do the same and that this is what he's teaching. Well, this is the old religious science, science of mind, mind science. It's, it used to be called New Thought. It was a heresy that sprang up in the church. They were pushed out of the church 50 to 100 years ago. That became the basis for uh, science of mind religious science, Christian science, and so forth. This thing began in a school of oratory, the Emerson School of Oratory in Boston, mm -hmm. uh, Massachusetts, towards the end of the last century. Mm -hmm. It was there that E.W. Kenyon studied for five years. Mm -hmm. And although he, re the father of the positive confession movement, and although he rejected uh, uh, new thought 
as a non-Christian uh, religion, he in fact came up with a Christianized version of new thought or mind science, and that is exactly what the positive confession movement is today. Hmm. You know, the thing that grieves me is that as I've listened to many of these men, there are many things that I agree with. Right, and, I do uh, too. For instance, the fact that uh, I do believe that as we claim the positive, as we positively exert our faith at claiming the promises of God, mm -hmm. that God does keep his promises. Right. But they certainly, all the promises of God assume, of course, that we're seeking God's will, mm -hmm. that we're seeking to live for him. Mm -hmm. And that I would agree with. In fact, I heard Fred, Fred Price define faith as uh, faith is acting upon the promises of God. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I would say that's true. Certainly, I would agree with that. And uh, it's, it seems, though, that it, it's, it's in this area where they've gone beyond mm -hmm. to say that there is a creative force in your, confe your, your faith right. confession, in the words that you confess, that in those words themselves that there is power. Right. That is <clears throat> the old mind trip. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a form of naturalism, as you know, mm -hmm. as opposed to supernaturalism. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a, a law that the, works. Right. There is a power within this universe. It's mm -hmm. a form of Hinduism, actually. Mm -hmm. And we can activate this by our thinking, by our speaking, by our visualizing. Mm -hmm. um, and we, in fact, are little gods. And God himself is subject to these laws, mm -hmm. you see. But that's not the God of the Bible. He is totally other. He is transcendent. He dwells in a light that no man can approach unto. He says, my ways are not your ways as the heavens are high above the earth so are my thoughts above yours we are not in god's class god is not in some fourth dimension mm -hmm. <clears throat> but he is the self-existent one whose existence depends upon none other than himself mm -hmm. so it's a it's an error but i believe that how it's an important error because we are saved by faith mm -hmm. we live by faith mm -hmm. and we cannot please god apart from faith now if we're wrong on faith mm -hmm. you see there's there's a difference here. Is faith a power, or must faith be in God? Right. If faith must be in God, then I cannot speak to this mountain and command it to move mm -hmm. unless I know, first of all, it is God's will mm -hmm. to move it, and when he wants it moved, and where he wants it moved. On the other hand, if it is some power that I could activate by the words I speak and the thoughts I think, mm -hmm. then it has nothing to do with my relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Now, I know these men would deny this. Mm -hmm. They would say, yes, we, we mean you must be in a right relationship, but that is not what they teach. And there are people out there who are who are trying to confess Cadillacs, mm -hmm. they're trying to confess healings, and we're getting hundreds and hundreds of letters from them saying it destroyed my faith, I came under guilt and condemnation, I couldn't make it work with the power of my mind, and mm -hmm. finally I abandoned everything. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a very important uh, uh, issue that has to be dealt with openly in the church, and I am certainly willing, I would welcome the opportunity to discuss these issues mm -hmm. with some of the leaders uh, on radio or television anytime and anywhere. Dave, have you been in correspondence with uh, any of the men that you talk about in your book? Uh, yes, uh, um, generally they don't reply. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's one of the criticisms, of course. So people say, well, have you gone to these people personally? Mm -hmm. And they will cite Matthew 18. Matthew 18 involves trespass mm -hmm. against if your brother trespass and mm -hmm. sins against you. These men are not sinned against me. Mm -hmm. It's a Matthew 18 is a private matter between two brothers, and it should be taken care of privately between them and not spread out to the church. Mm -hmm. But what we're talking about are doctrinal teachings that I believe to be in error mm -hmm. uh, that have been broadcast to millions and millions of people in books and radio and television mm -hmm. and therefore you can't deal with them privately mm -hmm. it must be dealt with publicly but I have tried also uh, to talk with these people I have made phone calls I have written letters mm -hmm. that have not been responded to Mm -hmm. uh, now, some have responded. I have had some discussions with some of these people. Well, the most popular criticism I've heard uh, of your book is that you didn't try to contact them before you wrote in the book. Mm -hmm. What's your answer to that? Well, there are a number of a number of problems there, Hal. Have you ever tried to get an appointment with Robert Schuller or Norman Vincent Peale or uh, Pat Robertson or whomever? You know, these are very busy men. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and uh, I couldn't get past their third secretary, not before the book was written. Now that the book is out, some of them would like to would like to see me. Mm -hmm. But I don't have the time or the money to travel around the country and try to sit down with these men. But furthermore, it's not a personal matter between me and them. Right. Paul rebuked Peter openly, mm -hmm. uh, Galatians chapter 2. I said to Peter before them all, I think it's something that has to be dealt with openly. I would love to discuss it openly with any of them on regular television, and I think it should be done. Good. Uh, we have a call from Bob in Sherman Oaks coming over KKLA. Bob, you're on the air. Uh, hi, Al. Uh, I, hi, Dave. I, I read your book, Production of Christianity. Interesting. Uh, my question is to you, Hal. Uh, you say you're a charismatic, and I've watched you on uh, Channel 40. Uh, I'd like for you to, de to define what you mean that you're a charismatic. And number two, one of the problems I see on 40 is that they have a tendency to go ahead and uh, claim promises that they require God to instantly answer. And I don't see that scripturally where they call down God, like I had an example, one program, uh, a person had a, um, a washing machine, and she claimed, and it was, I guess it was broke, she claimed uh, a promise, and she said that the washing machine was uh, fixed. Uh, I don't see that at all. Can you expound on that, please? Well, as best I can. First of all, uh, when I say I'm charismatic, I mean by that that I believe the only way that we can live the Christian life as God wants it lived is to be filled with the Spirit. And I believe that we can all have the filling of the Spirit by faith, by claiming the, uh, the promises that are in the Word of God that says that the Holy Spirit will produce the righteousness of the law in us, that He will enable us to walk with God. I do not mean by that that I think you have to have some special experience to be filled with the Spirit. So to me, being charismatic simply means that you believe that you have to walk moment by moment in dependence upon the Holy Spirit to live for God. Secondly, on claiming the promises of God, uh, I believe that uh, every promise that is in the Scripture is available to us today and that's the meaning of Hebrews 4 1 where it said let us therefore fear lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest meaning God's rest any of you should come short of it that's in a passage where it's telling us that the only uh, one of the few things Christians should fear one is God in a sense of uh, respect and the other is to fear that we would leave a promise that God has left us unclaimed I think one of the greatest sins in the Christian world is to worry. Most people don't see worry as a sin, but it's a maximum way of saying God doesn't care. So I believe that when we claim promises of God, we can expect God to keep them. Sometimes not immediately, sometimes he does. All right, this one's from Mike on Weinberg, Pennsylvania, coming over W-A-R-O. Mike, you're on the air, and this question's for Dave. Hello, David. Yes, Dave, how was that up? meeting last Saturday the night in Cannonsburg where you spoke. Uh -huh. And um, I asked the first question that evening, and as I'll start out again as I did at that time, I really appreciate your ministry. I think you're doing a great thing for the body of Christ. I think you're taking it a little bit to extremes. In the faith movement, the observation that I want to make is there are extremes in the faith movement, and they should be exposed. And I, I would particularly love to see you get one-on-one uh, -on -one with some of these people. I, I would really like to see that. Uh, I think it'd be beneficial to both and to all. But the thing that alarms me is after the meeting was over, people would come up to the front and they'd ask you, well, what about so-and-so? And, and what about, and I can name names, uh, I'm not going to, but what about so-and-so? And they you consistently have a negative attitude toward all of them. And, and many of them were not what you would call faith people. Now, I've been, I've went around and, and uh, taught at churches about rock music, and I've had kids come up when to ask me about this group and that group. Um, it's not that easy just to make a clear-cut answer. Why, why just show all the bad in people, uh, all the, what you call bad doctrine, uh, whenever there is so much good they are doing? Because what you're doing to those people that are asking those questions is you've completely shut their door to any positive teaching that they're coming because they esteem your opinion. What, what yeah. right do you have to do that? 
Okay, I don't have any any right to do what you're saying, but that's not what I'm doing. And, of course, uh, the listeners are going to have to take your word or my word. First of all, the people that they're asking me about are people that they have already discerned that there was something wrong. Uh, they're not asking me about everybody out there in the Christian world. So, uh, secondly, I'm not condemning people. I mean, the Word of God says, for example, 1 Corinthians 14:29. Let the prophets speak two or three by course, and let the others judge. Now, where is the judging going on? That's the problem. One of the problems that I'm trying to address. Things will come out, and, and on a talk show like this, praise God, you're able to address uh, these issues, question how uh, or, or whoever, but they're not always talk shows where you can do this. So all I'm doing is addressing some problems that I see that need to be addressed. I'm not condemning these people. I make that very clear. Uh, that uh, I'm not judging their heart, their motives, their ministry, but when they ask me specific questions about doctrinal issues on which I believe they are not biblical, then I must respond to those, you see? You know, Dave, one thing I can say is that I've seen some of the letters, I got copies of some of the letters that some of the people wrote to you, and they did condemn your character. Right. And uh, they didn't answer your arguments. They condemned you. Right. And, you know, I just have to say this, that the Lord told us in many places, particularly in Jude, where he says, I felt it necessary to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. My goodness, if we can't take issue right. with some of these things that we sincerely feel are contradicting the Bible, then Christianity is in a very sad condition indeed. That's a major problem that I see, How There doesn't seem to be any willingness to admit uh, by most of the people that we are mentioning in the book that they could be wrong on anything. I'm willing to be corrected. If I'm wrong, give me the facts and correct me openly. And if I'm more concerned about my reputation than I am for the millions of people who I may have led astray, then there's something wrong. But the, what the response that many people give is, you dare not question anything. We want peace, love, brotherhood. We want unity at any price. And supposing somebody's a little off on their doctrine, well, that's not important. Let's just love one another. I don't think that it must necessarily cause division to question doctrine. I mean, this is the modus operandi of the, of the Bible. Most of the New Testament was written to correct false, false teaching. And if we can't question someone's doctrine or at least raise our opinion in contrast to what they're saying without being accused of attacking and, and slandering and, and condemning, you know, and so forth, then I think that's an extreme reaction. It's a, it, people must be very defensive about their opinions, and I don't think we should be. Well, we have another caller, Loretta from Blue Springs, Missouri, coming over KCCV. Loretta, you're on the air. Yes, I am. Yes. I can't hear you too well, but um, I wanted to uh, say, number one, I know you're not surprised that KCV has lost their connections, and I got so annoyed that I decided to redeem my time with wisdom, and I was going to make this call. Okay. Uh, what I wanted to say was, number one, I want to thank you and Dave with all my heart for your faithful obedience to the Lord in researching and sharing your research with all of us. And I just can't say thank you enough. I am so excited. And I've got the book and I'm so excited. Uh, what I wanted to ask you is, uh, to Dave Hunt, if you have a minute, an, you know, in addition, you know, to the discussing of the positive thinking, I would appreciate it very, very much if you would make a comment in regard to liberation theology and its seduction of thousands of mainstream denominational people. It, I, I am dealing with it right here in the area where God has got me at, and I, I will tell you, it is really tough going yep. to really convince these people who are under this seduction how false it is. Yeah, well, liberation theology is one of the other streams that's feeding into this whole manifested sons teaching that we're going to take over the world. We're going to do it through social means. Uh, of course, it's very strong in the Catholic Church, but the same thing you're getting in the Protestant Church. The uh, And it's closely tied in with Marxism, unfortunately. It's based upon the fallacy that men are in, innately good, and if we just give them enough food and, and treat them fairly that everything will be okay and that's not true and these people would say for example that Jesus never preached to anybody 
before he fed them first. Uh, you can't preach to somebody on an empty stomach or if he's living in poverty. As a matter of fact, you remember, for example, the 5,000, uh, Jesus said to the disciples, uh, give them something to eat. And the disciples said, we don't have anything, send them home. Jesus said, they have been with us three days and they have had nothing to eat. And if we send them home now, they will faint on the way. We must feed them now. So Jesus preached to them for three days on an empty stomach. It hardly sounds like liberation theology to me. It just is not biblical. <laughs> Nerd that one for me. Well, I have, our next caller is Randy from Los Angeles, California, coming over KKLA. Randy, you're on the air. Hi, Hal and Dave. Uh, I didn't find anything that objectionable in, in your comments, Dave, toward the other uh, ministers and people you reference. I think that you could have contacted them uh, perhaps with a pre-publication script of your book and had them uh, offer to have them make a comment, and you could have included their comments or a lack of comment in an appendix. My question, Hal, is about Babylon. Uh, the 18th chapter of Revelation goes into great detail, as, other, as well as other references in uh, Revelation and in the Old Testament. Do you think, as you said in your book, The Late Great Planet Earth, that Babylon is merely symbolic? Uh, I just got back from a month in Mesopotamia, and they're spending millions of dollars in rebuilding uh, new projects, mainly with Japanese money, 50 miles south of Baghdad, where the ancient ruins of Babylon are. Do you think that Babylon will, in fact, be a new city? Well, actually, uh, in Revelation chapter 17, it says that he is talking about a mystery in Revelation 17, 5. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The whole thing is taking a nasty tone these days. It's, it's getting, you know, a little out of control. And I just think that if you're going to discuss what a man says, you know, on a network, it might be wise to have that man himself on so that he can tell others and not so that people hear from you what he says, but so they hear from him what he says. Uh, that is my only comment. And then I would like to ask, if I may, uh, Mr. Hunt, uh, you say you are spirit-filled. Do, do I take it to, I didn't understand your definition of the word charismatic. Do I take that to understand that you are a spirit-filled, that you operate in the gifts of the spirit? Well, that was not me who said that. That was Hal. So you, oh, I'm sorry. It's hard to tell you. Right? I didn't make such a statement, but uh, well, I believe... May I ask you, are you spirit-filled? Do I you operate in the gifts? I would like to ask you. Well, we would probably have a different definition of that. I would agree with A.W. Tozer that there is not one syllable in the New Testament to indicate that the gifts of the Spirit have passed away. So I believe in the gifts of the Spirit for today. But I also believe that it's not so simple as saying I'm operating in the gifts of the Spirit and advertising revival meeting tonight and we're going to call down the power of God and we're going to have all kinds of miracles happen. My personal, uh, you know, since you've asked me, I'm, I don't want to take too much time, but my personal belief would differ somewhat from the charismatics out there. For example, I don't believe that someone who has been given the gift of healing now has the power to go around and heal everyone that he pleases, as he pleases, whenever he pleases. I don't see that in the Bible, and I don't believe that anyone has ever demonstrated this down through history. You can go to, I mean, Catherine Kuhlman herself said that she could not pray for people and have them healed. I mean, she prayed for many who were not healed, okay? I believe that God ministers, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit comes through chosen vessels as He wills, in His time and His way as He sees the need and desires to meet it. Now, in my opinion, the same thing is true with speaking in tongues. Paul said, I thank God I speak with tongues more than you all. Now, if speaking in tongues was simply a matter of just turning on your mouth and letting it go, then I don't think Paul could have said that. I think that some little lady spinning thread all day long at home could have spoken in tongues a whole lot more than Paul did, who was out there ministering and, and, and working and, and so forth. So if you can't just heal whenever you want to, I don't think you can speak in tongues whenever you want to. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit, but I believe that it comes as God wills through his vessels and I think that most, in my opinion, and this is going to bring the wrath of the Charismatics upon me, but in my opinion, most of what passes for the gifts of the Spirit is not really the power of God at all. I think it's done in the flesh. I remember Dave Wilkerson, who's an old line Pentecostal himself, saying years ago that 95% of the people who think they're speaking in tongues aren't. Now, I don't know where he got that statistic. Um, so all I'm saying is I don't think it's so simple as saying, well, yeah, I'm operating in the gifts. Now let's operate and have some gifts going. I think that depends upon God's will at that particular time. Our next caller, Christy from Mooresville, Indiana, coming over WNTS. Christy, you're on the air. Yes, I can't hear you very well. Sorry. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say uh, 
I really appreciate Brother Hunt's book. I haven't read it yet, but um, we were in the faith message for seven years, and it became such a dangerous thing in our life. Many people in our group died. Um, the teacher became very critical. He wasn't humble. And I have seen the imbalance of this kind of teaching, this confession teaching in my own life. Um, I just want to say that um, for the people that are really into this kind of teaching, to really um, seek God in their life, to, um, to really question what their motives are b behind this kind of teaching. And I guess my question was to Brother Hunt, the Bible says that you'll know them by their fruits. Uh, I'd like to know, referring to this scripture, how, how does this scripture as a basic rule, how can we judge these kind of erroneous teachings? You know, actually that scripture in Matthew 7 is talking about false prophets. That's one of the marks of a false prophet. But as far as the fruit of the, of the book, as I mentioned earlier, we are getting hundreds and hundreds of letters, uh, thousands actually, from people who are saying that this, what has been called a negative book, <laughs> is producing tremendous transformation in their lives, setting them free from condemnation and depression. Uh, that they've been under, bringing them back to the Word of God, making Christ come alive and real in their lives, uh, a, a walk of faith and joy with the Lord.